I know we've talked about this concept several times in the past few weeks. I thought it'd be good to actually address where I got it from, Matthew chapter 8, verses 18 through 22. And basically a question, am I a disciple or just a part of the crowd? In John chapter 8, verse 31, Jesus proclaims, and he proclaimed it to the Jews who believed in him, were following him at that time. If you abide in my word, you are my truly my disciples. And it's hard for it's a hard concept for some people really to understand because they've heard so many other concepts about what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be a, a disciple. There are a lot of shortcuts out there. There are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of what I believe is false teaching, uh, at least not what the Bible teaches about being a disciple of Jesus, about being uh, a Christian. And it breaks down in various ways, but some people want to be disciples without doing what Jesus said to be a disciple. So, you know, they'll, they'll take some parts of the Bible, maybe need to know parts of the Bible. I, we talked about it before, Karen and I, we worked with a girl one time that uh, she believed just because she moved from overseas to the United States that she's now a Christian because the United States is a Christian nation. That's, that was her concept of it. Somebody had taught her that or she just picked it up somehow. So there are various things. You know, some say, well, I grew up in a Christian family or whatever. My, my grandmother was a Christian, so that makes me Christian. You know, something of that nature. Uh, but then you go on a little bit further, some disciples of Jesus want to, uh, do not want to abide in or live according to his word. There are some people that will do what's necessary to become a disciple of Jesus or become a Christian, but then they think that's the end of it because of this, this alternate, hey, that, that, I think that would be a good term. We hear uh, alt stuff out there all the time in, in culture, don't we? The alt right and the alt left. And not, how about alt church? There's church and there's alt church. There's Christianity and there's alt Christian. A L T hyphen whatever. So uh, maybe we could use that phrase and some people wouldn't be offended. Nah, they'd be offended. Well, I'll get to that point for a year. But but yeah. The, and, and I've met people in the church because there, there, there's an attitude, and I think I've talked about it before, I, I've met women, talked to women who say, oh, if I could just get my husband to be baptized, he'll be okay. You can get him wet, but that won't make it okay if he doesn't obey, or doesn't believe, and he doesn't repent, and all that, you know, it, it won't do any good. Same way with your children. It, it, just doesn't do any good to get them wet. Uh, you get the cat wet, just makes it mad, you know. And sometimes, you know, the husband just has to give in, you know, whatever. And they do, but you get the point. And uh, some people get upset when they're challenged with the words of Jesus about what a person must do to become a Christian or a disciple, and and to continue to be a disciple. And then, do you catch the contradiction in that? Maybe even some irony in that? That Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then you are my truly my disciples. But if you bring up what Jesus said, what the words actually are, they get upset with that. If you say it contradicts what the word contradicts what they believe. They still want to be the disciples of Jesus, but not according to what he teaches. But, but how, does that, how does that work? See, I don't know. But in some people's minds, that's kind of what they go through, and we find people out there. So, you know, uh, <laughs> what, what's the easy answer? Hey, don't preach on that stuff. Just leave that be because we 
we've got this brand new building that we got to pay for, or we got this big project over here, you know, we got this big name preacher who's got this big salary. And you can find a hundred different excuses why not preach the gospel, which is the power of God to salvation. Because we don't want to offend people anymore. I heard a great, a great example of being offensive in the modern day. It used to be when people were offended by something, they went home and they just avoided people. Now, if, if you say something that offends people, they want you to be wrapped in bubble wrap so that, so that you don't offend them. It's, a, it's up to you not to offend them in any way, shape, or manner. I walk down the street and I offend people. You know, I don't have to say anything. I just offend people. But, Get the picture there, but yeah, you see it. Jesus calls us to count the cost of discipleship. He said that, you know, you know, what person builds a tower that he doesn't sit down first and determine whether he can, he's got enough to pay for. Say, so, well, that's about discipleship. Are we going to be in it to do it? Are we in it for the long haul? Or are we just just we want to be there for the first floor. Get the first floor built and hey, that's it. Somebody else can take care of the, the rest of that tower. Uh, well, he wants us to count the cost of discipleship, not so we can stand in awe of a few good disciples, but so that we can truly be the disciples of Jesus. I think, I think that's important. I really do. I think that's important for each and every one of us because it was very important for Jesus. It was so important for him that he brought it up there in John chapter 8 and verse 31. So let's go to Matthew chapter 8 and let's start there at the 18th verse and, and see what Jesus is saying about some things about disciples and crowds, okay? Now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go to the other side. Matthew here, by the Holy Spirit, uh, indicates Jesus' motives for crossing to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. He was over on the Capernaum side, which is the west side, and he had just fed 5,000 men, uh, not counting the women and children, a great miracle, and there were multitudes of people, a big crowd followed him, followed him back down to Capernaum, Capernaum's on the Sea of Galilee, and he's out by the seashore, and he's preaching, and he's teaching, and he's casting demons out of people, and he's healing people of diseases, and you know what they're doing? They're just pressing on him, so he's backed up to the edge of the water, and he tells his closest disciples, he says, get in the boat, let's go to the other side. He had preached and he had taught. The crowd was pressing on him. But he had already claimed, John chapter 6, verse 26 through 29, and most of them weren't really there to listen to him teach. They were there for the loaves and the fishes. Or they were there to see a miracle. They were there to, to uh, see a show. They weren't really there to learn. They weren't really there to listen. They were just a crowd. The crowd and their clamoring to have their physical needs fulfilled stood in the way of Jesus fulfilling what he had come to do. And that was to make disciples. Make disciples. Because once he would make a disciple, I'll stop there. You begin to think about what would happen after he would make a disciple. Now, they were excited about what Jesus could do for them, but they did not have the heart to become like Jesus. We've got to grasp that. We've got to get our hands around that. We've got to get our minds around that. Is that what 
be one. Jesus, what can you do for me? That's kind of narcissistic, isn't it? That's kind of self-serving, isn't it? Jesus, what can you do for me? John Kennedy said, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. Everybody goes, wow, oh, wow, wow, listen to that. That's a great thing. And yeah, it is. But you know, Jesus says, you want loaves and fishes? Won't you ask what God wants? Won't you ask what I want? I, I can't, I'll come and I'll die for you, say. I'll die for you. I'll die so that you can have forgiveness of sins and you can have eternal life. What do you want me to do for you? Won't you ask what you can do for me? Sometimes we get it wrong, don't we? I mean, I've, I've, been, I've got it wrong in my life many times and still do every now and then. Maybe not every now and then. More often than now and then. But yeah, and that's the human nature of it. But that's what Jesus saw in this crowd. Now, what would happen if Jesus could make one disciple? Well, if he could make two disciples. But what if he could make 12 disciples? Count them out there. What if he could make 12? What would happen then? What if those 12 would go out and make 12? One of those 144 went out and made each of those made 12 more. I can't multiply that quickly in my head. You see how we grow? And that's what they were supposed to, that's what he had planned. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That's the Godhead. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. There's the essence of disciples making disciples in a perpetuity. Jesus did not say, go therefore and make a crowd. But that's what modern day church growth is based upon, isn't it? You've got to grow a crowd. You've got to get a crowd. You've got to get a big crowd. You've got to have a big band to get them in there. And you've got to have that, that preacher who's written two or three big books that everybody wants to read and says the right things and smiles all the time, you know, like that guy on TV has got the 30 million dollar oh, you know. <laughs> hey, I learned a long time ago, don't trust somebody who smiles all the time. There's something false about them, okay? But that's the church growth strategy. Give them what they want. Don't preach against sin. Say, we're all going to the same place, right? Someone said, and I think it's correct, give them bells and whistles to get them in. You're going to have to give them more bells and whistles to keep them there. And eventually, bells and whistles is what it's all about. It's not about the gospel any longer. Go to all the world and make disciples. Doing what? Teaching them about the gospel. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to, to live, to abide. Yes, teaching them to abide in Jesus' words. Yeah, that's what it's all about. Look at the definition of a disciple. It's very simple, the definition. Uh, from the Greek word mathetes, uh, uh, it's a student or a learner. That's where it comes from. But you know, there are words in the Greek because the Hebrew language and the Greek language, even the Latin, you know why the Latin version is called the Vulgate? Because it comes from the same word as vulgar. You know what vulgar means? Today it means dirty, right? But it's not dirty, it means it's common. No, it's common language. Elitists and civilized people don't talk vulgar language. But that's, it's a working language. It's what common people spoke. And in the Greek, the Koine Greek that Jesus used and the disciples used was just the common language. It's 
we speak common English, don't we? Uh, we every, when we speak, we kind of butcher the Queen's English, right? Uh, but that's the way it is. But uh, you appropriate terms and you sanctify some terms. You give them a holy meaning, a sanctified meaning. And so, mathetes, uh, a disciple, a learner, or a student, when it's used in Bible terms, Jesus and the Bible gives it a more sanctified use. It means much more. A disciple is someone who follows the master with an M, not just the teacher. You know, you go to school, and as a student, you're supposed to learn what the teacher is teaching you. Okay? Right? But when we come to church, we're supposed to learn what the master teacher is teaching us. Say, so I'm just an in-between here. That's all I am. And if any one of you are up here teaching, that's what you are. You're just an in-between. It's what the master is teaching. So uh, it is someone whose life is shaped by the teaching of the master. It is someone who becomes like the master teacher in every way, adopting his values, his principles, his attitudes, and his actions. That's what it's all about, to become like him. In short, a disciple is molded and shaped in the master's image. I love Luke 6.40. A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. Brothers and sisters, when we're fully trained, we'll be like our teacher, our master. That's a goal for us. That's what we want to be like. That's what we're striving for. And Paul understood that. Paul understood that even as an apostle, he was that intermediary. Uh, pointing people to Jesus. Look at Galatians 4.19. My little children for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. He had, he had presented the gospel to them and converted them and they started to stray away. He says, come on back. Stop the direction you're going in. Christ is no longer being formed in you. Please, please, turn around, repent, come back. And I, I, I like giving birth to a child again until Christ be formed in you. Is Christ being formed in us? That's what we're supposed to be about. And when Christ is formed in us, we'll be able to help others for Christ to be formed in us. Them. And that's what this discipleship is about. You see, Jesus calls us out of the crowd and into discipleship. Well, you got to have a crowd so that you can get into discipleship. No, listen, there's something about the crowd. I don't know. Let me go back here. Let me go back. Did I miss something? Did I miss something? Crowds, crowds, crowds. have this way of taking control. Crowds have a way of taking over. I think it was back where I wanted to talk about bells and whistles. What did I do? That's an introduction. Yeah, crowds tend to take control of situations and circumstances. I just missed that one little part there. A crowd will take over. I've seen that happen in churches. I've been the victim of it. Okay? But people who don't have the right attitudes, people who don't have the right thought processes, it's about power. It's about control. So Jesus calls us out of that crowd. It's not about drawing crowds, it's about making disciples. You know, 
used to be that brethren went out through the week and talked to their neighbors about the church and about the gospel and brought them to services and, and especially brought them to gospel meetings when because sometimes churches didn't have preachers and a preacher would come in for a gospel meeting and these people would be taught and then the preacher would kind of put the icing on the cake and they'd be baptized at these gospel meetings and they'd, they'd become members of the church and the, the worship service would be there for basically worship but not anymore now we don't go out and do personal evangelism we have to do it at the worship service. We bring people to church to teach them how to become Christians instead of coming to church to praise God and to encourage one another to live as Christians. I think we, 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 we've, we've evolved, and maybe that's a bad thing. We need, we need more personal evangelism. Y'all can so pause. Get back to my point. Where am I? <laughs> to become a disciple, we must cross over with Jesus to the other side. He calls us out of the crowd into discipleship. He said, Do you catch that? Say, the crowd was there. The crowd was trying to take control. Jesus wasn't able to do what he had come to do. Jesus says, Let's skedaddle out of here. We'll go, we'll go somewhere else and really do what I came to do do but you got to get to the other side to get to the other side you got to get to the boat hey and i was thinking about that on the way over here this morning think about that ark that noah built you want to get saved you have to get in the ark right <laughs> you want to get saved you better get in the church but you better better get in jesus church okay how do you do that? Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Why into his death? Because that's where his blood was shed, right? That's where we contact his blood. And that's, that's Colossians chapter 1 and verse 12. And I think on down chapter 2 talks about it too. We were buried, therefore, with him by with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And if we've been planted with him in the likeness of his death, we should be raised with him in the likeness of his resurrection. <laughs> that you like him? Isn't that what we were talking about earlier? A disciple to be like the master? Well, that's where we start, isn't it? And that's where we grow after that. So we have to commit ourselves to him and live with him as, a cent as the center of our lives. But that commitment is to kill that old man, that old person that used to be. Matthew, by the Holy Spirit, next asks us to consider Jesus' interactions with two people who approach him about discipleship. I want you to look at these two people in context of what I started off with. The person who wants to be a disciple but wants to do it his own way, not Jesus' way. And then the person who is a disciple but wants to be a disciple his way, not Jesus' way. Does that make sense? That's right there. It's so simple, it's right there. The Holy Spirit is so far ahead of us, it's unbelievable. It's like Q, isn't it? You like Q? You really like Q? You enjoying Q? You got her turned on to Q yet? Okay. Thanks for time. Okay, so Karen's, Karen's, Karen's come on to Q now. Okay? Back to the lesson. <laughs> you hate the first one. First, a first person hears the scribe. And a scribe came up and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Remember, he was from Nazareth, and he got run out of town. They were going to 
kill him. They were going to stone him to death, so he left there and he goes over to Capernaum and he stays in Peter's house in Capernaum. He doesn't have a house. Anytime he goes anywhere, he's got to stay in somebody's house. He doesn't own the house. Right? And here's this scribe. Oh, what's important about this scribe? He wanted to become a disciple of Jesus. I follow you anywhere. But Jesus just didn't welcome him with open arms. Oh, you want to be a disciple? Okay. You know, sometimes we do that. Somebody says, I want to be a part of your church. Okay, come on, come on. Hey, great deal. Fantastic. Uh, be careful. You've got to become a Christian. You've got to be a disciple. You've got to go, got to go through the process, okay? Now. Instead, Jesus asked this scribe to count the cost, didn't he? And what was the cost? Sometimes you're going to have to sleep out on the ground. Some days you might go without eating. Yeah, I'm going to feed 5,000, but some days you might not eat. You go with that? So what was this scribe's deal? He was a scribe, right? What do scribes do? They write things, right? Maybe he said, hey, you know, Jesus, you're an up-and-coming young evangelist. You're going to be a star. I will, I'll write your biography. I'll, be, I'll follow you, and I'll write your biography, and we'll both be famous, right? I don't know. Maybe that was what his spot was, but, boy, he got, he got a shock, didn't he? And sometimes we tell people, hey, if you just become a Christian, your life will be so easy. Well, that's what that smiley guy down in Houston talks about. Right? They're not dealing with Christian reality. Okay? You know that there's a group and there's another guy. He, he has a big place down in Dallas. They have seminars, like great, giant conventions every year that, that they have, and they call in people from everywhere and they teach people how to make money on the church. Amen. How to write books. How to produce items for church. Christian, yeah, Christian businesses. That's what the church is to those people. I believe Jesus will condemn them properly at the proper time. But I think that was the attitude of this scribe. As disciples, we are to be sojourners in this planet that is not our home. This is not our home. Our home is in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. We're, we're living in a fallen world. There's nothing we have here that is really our own. We can't take it with us. A disciple must be willing to sacrifice, suffer, to need be to die for the sake of Christ. I don't think this scribe got in the boat with you. Then there's the second guy. Okay? But listen to this. And this is what got me. Because it's one of those that you read it, you read it, you read it, you read it, and all of a sudden, I never saw that before. What's it say? What's the first word? Another disciple. What? Another disciple. How long has this guy followed Jesus? I don't know. The text doesn't tell me. It doesn't tell us. He's followed Jesus for a while. Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus says, get in the boat. We're going to the other side. Jesus, let me first go and bury my father. And it's not that his father is dead. No. And Jesus said to him, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. Not that his father's dead. This is kind of like a, a Hebrew idiom, a Hebrew expression that's saying, well, uh, Jesus, let me go home to my father's house, and when he's dead and I get the inheritance and I've got that money, then I'll come and follow you. 
And that's why Jesus says, let the dead bury the dead. If his father had been dead, he was going to the funeral. Jesus said, okay, we'll go with you and we'll go mourn with you. Because the scripture says, mourn with those who mourn, right? Right? But, but that's what, what it was about. Going to the other side of the Sea of Galilee was not in this disciples' immediate plans. Uh, so what was Jesus' response? That shows he expects his disciples to obey. And really to obey without delay. And Jesus doesn't tell us to pick up and go to a foreign country never told any of us that. That's, that's the things that, that we do and, and these other people out here. How many times have you heard, the Lord told me to go to India and preach. Let's be honest. Yeah. Let's be honest. That's in the person's mind. That's what they want to do. And that's all right. Now, Jesus did say go. And if that's what you want to do, that's fine. And if we can't go, we can help. That's fine. But let's make sure that it's done properly and all. Okay? But more important, what Jesus is saying is follow me. Jesus is saying follow me. That's the important thing. He can still follow Jesus by going home to his father's house. Right? Jesus, I know you're going to the other side. Jesus, I, I appreciate it. I don't really want to go to the other side. I'm going to take what you taught me. I'm going to go teach my father before he dies. That wasn't this man's intention, was it? Go get the inheritance because he had gone and taught his father, who was probably a Jew. His father had probably cut him off from his inheritance right there. You see the picture, you see what's going on. So there we are. Jesus saying, yeah, You're better off coming with me. Come on, right now. I don't think this guy got from the boat either. See, we get these things. <laughs> Acts 22, 16. Remember about the Saul of Tarsus? What does he say? Was he saved out on the road to Damascus when he saw Jesus? No. That's something more we're going to talk about later on uh, when we talk about how to study the Bible, some of the things that people grew up with. No. Acts 22, 16 tells us when he was saved. He was saved in the, uh, when uh, Ananias come and preached to him. And now why do you wait, rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name, or calling on his name, calling on the name of the Lord? Now here, here, here's something for you. John 10, 34, as we close. Jesus said of himself in John 10, verses 3 and 4, the sheep hear his voice. And he's talking about the good shepherd. Okay? The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. When you pick up the, the Bible and you read it, do you hear God speaking to you? Do you hear Jesus speaking to you? Or do you hear Jesus speaking to your neighbor? Or Jesus speaking to your spouse, or Jesus speaking to your children. So that's what makes a big difference to us. Amen. When we hear Jesus speaking to us individually, that's what makes a difference in our lives. So what about us? Are we disciples or are we just part of the crowd? Remember what we said about a crowd. A crowd can be part of the problem. But a disciple will be a part of the solution. Everybody's solution. Begin with our own. Hey, hey, thank you for your time. Well, thank you for your attention. God bless. If you have a need, let your request be made known. Stay with the same invitation song.